The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to NOVA's presentation of Plan Design Features to Consider for 2024 with Jason Worms. Before we get started, I'd like to point out the panel on the top right-hand corner of your screen. You will see a drop-down section for questions and chat. This is where you will enter in any questions that you may have for Jason. Please keep in mind that the Q&A portion of this webinar will be held at the end and he will answer as many questions as time permits. If time does run out and you still have questions, please send them to our email address, webinars at nova401k.com. Right below questions in chat, you will see the handouts drop down. Here you will be able to download today's material. If you are with us today to earn continued education credits, uh, please be sure to stay until the end to fill out our survey. This will allow us to track your time and participation. Certificates will be sent out within a week for those who have met the time requirements. To view any webinars you may have missed and the recording of this session, you can follow us on our YouTube channel, which is nova 401 k Associates, or visit our website, which is wwwnova 401 kcom backslash webinars. Thank you for joining us today. I would now like to introduce team leader for NOVA's central administration team, Jason Worms. Thanks, Yvette. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for taking time out of your busy day to uh, attend this webinar on plan design considerations for 2024. Um, there is an, uh, a very large amount of information on this webinar. So before we get started, um, what I, I don't expect a lot of time for questions at the end. So if you do have questions, uh, please mark the slide that you have questions about and talk with your account manager directly. They'll be able to provide you the best individual guidance for your individual plans needs. Um, but it is gonna be a lot of information and we're gonna have to move through it pretty quickly to get through it all in the hour. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, this information is not, um, legal or tax advice. Um, it is general in nature and doesn't apply to your specific plan or circumstance. Um, please talk with your account manager, your tax professional, um, or, your, um, or an attorney uh, if you have very detailed questions on any of these particular items that we're talking about today. Yvette mentioned the CPE or CPA continuing education credits. Um, so here is Nova's provider number. Um, you'll need this for the end of the webinar in order to get your uh, to get your credit. Okay, so here's a quick agenda. Why are we going to consider changes to our plans? Talking about some limits, um, going into a bunch of various plan design considerations, some plan amendment requirements, and then uh, a little bit of time at the end for some questions. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about why plans changes can be considered, um, and then talking about the process and the timing for plan amendments um, that we're going to be dealing with. So the biggest thing is the needs and, um, and design of a plan changes over a plan's life cycle. So even if you had a plan that was set up absolutely perfectly for your for the way that you do business, for the size of your company, um, for your cash flow, you know, five, 10 years ago, it probably isn't still meeting all of those goals today. So having regular assessments of your plan's provisions is going to go a long way to make sure that the plan stays um, meeting the requirements that you have for this uh, valuable benefit for your employees. Um, you know, the state of the economy can change, um, regulations are changing even faster. Um, than they have in the past for retirement plans. Um, a lot of record keepers out there are changing their systems to comply not only with those changes, but offer enhancements to the participant experience. Um, retirement plans are becoming um, a weapon in the, in the talent war, um, you know, and uh, when we've got all the quiet quitting going on and it's hard to find people, um, you have, a, ret a good retirement plan can tip the balance for that person who's uh, trying to decide between a couple of different jobs. And then, um, you know, the biggest thing is you don't want your employees to be complaining about your retirement plan. So you want to have a plan where the provisions make sense and make sense for your particular company and what you're trying to accomplish. It makes it a lot easier to explain it when an employee asks why a provision is a certain way. So just to refresh for 2023, um, we, these are the current retirement plan limits. So, um, one of the, 
One of the benefits, may, perhaps the only one, depending on your outlook um, to high inflation rates is it means that retirement plan benefit limits increase substantially. So for 401k and Roth deferrals in 2023, the deferral limit is $22,500. If you are over the age 50, you're eligible for a catch up of an additional $7,500, meaning that we get to $30,000 in employee contributions now uh, in a single year with the new limits. Compensation for plan purposes is limited to 330,000. That is important for you to know and have in your payroll system if you have um, employees who make over this number and you do a per pay period match or employer allocation because $330,000 is the maximum amount that you can calculate those employer calculations off of. Uh, employees can have a total of $66,000 plus any catch-up contributions contributed to their account in a calendar year. So uh, again, a big increase over the previous year, um, allowing for those plans that like to max out their contributions um, to really sweeten the pot for them there. Limits for, for these retirement plans are updated annually, and usually the IRS releases the numbers for the next year in the October or November timeframe. So we're a couple of months away from getting the 2024 limits, um, but there will be communications from NOVA when those limits are released so that you can set up your payroll systems um, in advance. Okay, one of the biggest things uh, when you're looking at your plan provisions is eligibility. Eligibility refers to what a, an employee has to do before they can join the plan and start to contribute. So some plans, you want everybody to participate. Some plans, by design, you want to limit the number of people who participate. So it really is going to depend for you on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, if you want to increase participation, you know, uh, it helps more of your employees save for retirement. Um, if you make it easy to participate and you have a really um, engaged workforce that a lot of them want to contribute to the plan, or because of your, your communication efforts to your participants, many of them choose to, to contribute to the plan, that will help your non-discrimination testing, your top-heavy testing, a lot of that stuff gets helped out by higher participation rates. Um, a robust plan um, also uh, like I said, it can be a recruiting tactic, right? It can get good um, new employees in the door. The, of course, everything has a, has a downside and high participation rates um, do increase employer contribution costs. Um, so if you have a match or a profit sharing safe harbor plan, the more people that contribute, generally speaking, the more money you're gonna have to shell out to those employees um, for those employer contributions. Um, so moving along from here, um, there are some ways that you can get around in, uh, offering the plan to more people, but still limiting your costs. One of the things you can do is called dual eligibility. So what that means is that you have different eligibility provisions for different money types in the plan. Um, so for example, you can allow employees to contribute their deferrals um, pretty much you know, upon hire or after three months but you can force people to wait up to a year before they're eligible to receive matching contributions. Um, so if you have a high turnover industry um, or um, you know, those types of things, it might make sense for you to hold off on making people eligible for the employer contributions until they have been around uh, for that year requirement. Okay, um, for those plans that are not a safe harbor plan. So you don't make a safe harbor match or a safe harbor non-elective contribution. You are subject to um, ADP, ACP, non-discrimination testing. Um, and pretty much that is comparing the deferral rates of the highly compensated employees against the deferral rates of the other employees. And the difference between those two groups um, has to be within certain um, parameters that are, um, that are laid out by the IRS, okay? Um, <clears throat> The IRS allows us to do testing in one of two ways. One is to look at the current year deferral rates for both the highly paid group and the non-highly paid group and compare those. The second way is what's called prior year testing, where we look at the prior year's deferral rate for um, all of the other employees compared to the current year's deferral rate for the highly compensated employees. 
that has the advantage of allowing the highly compensated employees to know what their limit is to avoid refunds for each year. So if your plan is subject to this ADP testing and you've either failed in the past or and gotten refunds, or you just don't want to fail in the first place, this prior year testing option may be something that you'll be interested in. So, um, so again, if you are not a safe harbor plan, and if you're anywhere close to having refunds as a result of your ADP test, this prior year testing option might be a good one. The same thing applies for the ACP test, um, but oftentimes we, uh, we like to keep that one on a current basis because it provides more flexibility if for some reason you have to stop your match for a year. Okay, safe harbor plans. Hopefully um, you guys know at least a little bit about those. They've been around for over 20 years now, believe it or not. Um, and what it does is it says that if you make a, um, a specific type of contribution to all employees who are eligible for the plan, then your highly compensated employees do not have to worry about refunds or um, having returns um, from the ADP test. And the plan is automatically considered to meet the top heavy requirements. So those things are, are things that are worth um, that are worth getting. And so some companies think it's worth the amount of the contribution to make that happen. There are a couple of ways that you can meet the safe harbor requirements. The first one is called a non-elective, and it is very simple because it is 3% of compensation to all eligible participants. It does not matter if they are deferring to the plan or not, everybody gets it. Um, the thing with safe harbor contributions is you cannot have any allocation requirements on them, which means that you cannot require an employee to be employed on the last day of the plan year. You cannot require a participant to um, work for at least a thousand hours in the year. Um, they are eligible for that contribution. And if you make the contribution after somebody terminates, they are still eligible to receive those funds. Um, similar to the non-elective, the other option is the safe harbor match. And so what that is, is it's going to be based on the amount that the participants actually contribute to the plan themselves. Um, so the, the amount that each individual participant can receive through the match is a little bit higher than it would be for the non-elective, but it requires the participant to put some of their own money up uh, to get there. Uh, usually, the uh, match contributions require the participant to put in at least 4% and sometimes 5% of their compensation in order to receive the maximum match amount. Um, but there are various um, match formulas that can still fall under the safe harbor, including ones that are more lucrative than that. Okay, safe harbor benefits. We talked about this a little bit, but it avoids refunds for the highly compensated employees. Um, it satisfies the top heavy requirements, and we can use those safe harbor contributions if you're gonna make a profit sharing contribution on top of it to meet some of the other testing requirements known as the minimum gateway. Um, it's a required contribution if you go safe harbor. So if your business takes a downturn, the IRS isn't gonna hear it. You're gonna be on the hook to make those contributions to the plan. Um, no service hours um, for the allocation, the contribution is also 100% vested at the time that it is made to the plan. So you cannot apply a vesting schedule to these contributions. Um, they have to be 100% vested from the start. You can um, elect the safe harbor later in the year, but for the most part, you have to make the decision on whether you're gonna be a safe harbor um, at least one month and preferably two months before the end of the current year. So if you're looking to go safe harbor for 2024 for your plan, you need to make that decision in early November um, to get all the gears in motion and all the notices and things out to people. Also, if you're a safe harbor plan, it restricts the types of changes that you can make to the plan in general. So some safe harbor plans don't allow you to add or remove certain provisions during the year. So you lose a little bit of flexibility um, when you become a safe harbor plan. Okay, um, the biggest thing about the SECURE Act, the SECURE Act 1.0, is that the safe harbor non-elective can now be added to the plan after or during the plan year that you wanna be safe harbor. So this can be a big deal. 
Um, if, for example, you are here in 2023, and here we are in July, and you're like, oh my goodness, we are going to fail the ADP test so much, and the refunds to my highly compensated employees are going to be enormous, can we adopt Safe Harbor? Yes, you can, um, but you have to still make that 3% contribution at the end of the year for all of your employees. You can even wait until you get your discrimination testing results and say, hey, look at all these refunds. There's gotta be something else we can do. You can, except that now the cost goes up a little bit. So if you wait until 2024 to wanna be safe harbor for 2023, then you have to do a 4% of compensation contribution to all of your participants, okay? So you do have some options, but uh, they are a little bit pricey if you're not prepared for it. Okay, that's uh, putting a bow in Safe Harbor. Like I said before, if you have questions about these things, please bring these, uh, you know, put a highlight on the slide that you're looking at and talk to your individual account manager. They can provide you a, a much more nuanced and specialized to your plan discussion about these provisions. So next up is uh, we're gonna be talking about Roth contributions. Roth is a big deal because um, this is the way that a lot of contributions are going. Congress likes Roth contributions very much because they put more money in their own coffers. Um, and you're gonna see a lot of more options with Roth contributions than we've had in the past. So Roth has been around since 2006. Um, many plans offer Roth contributions now, but not all of them do. Um, and if you're not familiar with a Roth, a Roth is a after-tax 401k contribution. So regular contributions to the plan go in on a pre-tax basis. Roth contributions go in on an after-tax basis. The other good thing about Roths compared to the pre-tax is that Roth contributions and their earnings grow tax-free. So when the participant takes a distribution of their Roth funds, they do not pay income taxes on those amounts. Contrast that with a traditional 401k deferral where there's no taxes taken out at the time of contribution to the plan, the earnings grow tax deferred as well, but when the participant takes a distribution out of their pre-tax account, both the original contribution and the earnings are subject to income tax, okay? So that's where the, the distinction between a Roth and a pre-tax account is. Um, and there's a bullet point in here about why an employee would choose a Roth compared to a pre-tax account. Okay, um, the Roth 401k um, is also a benefit if you've got people that are making too much money to contribute to a Roth IRA, um, and the Roth 401k limits are much higher than Roth IRAs are. So here's a, a nice little chart. I'm not gonna go through um, this in complete detail, um, but, uh, you know, this is one of those things that's just nice to have a good little comparison of why someone would choose a Roth or a traditional 401k deferral. Okay, uh, some things to consider when you're dealing with a Roth. Um, because participants now have two options for their employee contributions, your systems have to be able to accommodate that, right? So your payroll system has to have an ability to track pre-tax contributions and Roth contributions. Participants have to be able to make the same or different deferral elections for each of those two money types. Um, Roth contributions need to be combined with pre-tax contributions when determining any match amounts. Um, so in, if, it's, if it's a new feature to your plan, you're gonna wanna do some communication and education with your employees. Your financial advisor can be a good resource for that. Um, your record keeper can also provide some good educational resources if you need them. Okay, um, another interesting thing about Roth contributions, and again, Congress likes getting paid, and so they like Roth. Uh, Roth contributions, you can do conversions of pre-tax traditional 401k dollars into Roth amounts. Um, this was has been around for a long time now, um, but a lot of record keepers are just now being able to accommodate this on their system. And what it does is just says that if you have a pre-tax account, you can convert it to a Roth account. That conversion means that you take a distribution, essentially, in the eyes of the IRS, 
and then you um, then you invest those distributed proceeds in a Roth account. So it does generate tax liability for the participant to do this, um, but it also allows them to keep their money in the plan and convert pre-tax dollars into Roth dollars. So for the people that really wanna do this, this can be a big help to them. Um, it is not used a ton, but uh, there are plans out there that, that do this a lot and for very good reasons. Uh, in order to do a Roth conversion, you have to allow Roth 401k contributions in your plan. Um, the plan is not required to do tax withholding at the time of conversion, but some participants may request it to reduce their liability when they file their tax return at the end of the year. If you do want to add this provision, most NOVA plans do not have this provision in there by default. It will take a plan amendment, and it does have to be executed in the year that you want it to um, to be allowed to do to do these contributions. Okay, the next big one, and again, Congress is taking a big interest in this, so we're gonna spend some time talking about this, is automatic enrollment. <clears throat> and automatic enrollment is designed to take advantage of um, employees' inertia. So what it does is it says, instead of you having to affirmatively elect to join the plan, the idea is that you're going to be enrolled in the plan um, as a default, with, and then you have to affirmatively elect out of the plan, okay? Um, so automatic enrollment uh, from a plan sponsor perspective is a boon because it improves the 401k non-discrimination test results. So that's your ADP and ACP testing, makes it much less likely that you're gonna have refunds to your highly compensated employees. Um, Policymakers are making a big push to include automatic enrollment for all plans, um, not to foreshadow too heavily, but in the SECURE Act 2.0 that just passed, all new plans after a certain date are gonna be required to be automatic enrollment. So it is a big deal, um, and people are gonna to have to know how to, how to accommodate these, these provisions. So there's three different types, um, and we in the retirement industry love our acronyms. So um, you have an, a regular automatic contribution arrangement, um, you have an eligible automatic contribution arrangement, and you have a qualified automatic contribution arrangement, an ACA, a YACA, and a QUACA. Um, so each one, each layer has a little bit more regulation, a little bit more bells and whistles, but allows you to do more things. So um, the eligible automatic contribution arrangement um, has uh, increases your ADP ACP refund deadline um, from three and a half months, or excuse me, two and a half months to six months. Um, so you have longer, you're not rushing around the March 15th deadline quite as much. And it allows um, participants to opt out of their automatic enrollment. So if they decide, hey, actually, I didn't really want to participate in this at all, then they can take a distribution out of the amount that's already been um, put into the plan. The qualified automatic enrollment or automatic contribution arrangement um, is a new-ish type of safe harbor. So it's a match that goes along with it. It can be a non-elective contribution also. Um, it has a few more bells and whistles than your typical safe harbor contributions do. Um, and, as, and that is a result of the additional administrative um, requirements that an that a automatic enrollment plan has. So the biggest benefit for automatic enrollment is increased participation. So whether your goal is that all of your participants are contributing towards their own retirement, or you just want to fail, or you just want to pass your compliance testing, that automatic enrollment will work for you. Um, just like anything that increases participation in your plan, if you have a match contribution, it's going to increase your cost on the matches. The biggest thing for automatic enrollment is it requires a lot of coordination because as soon as somebody is eligible, you gotta start withholding money from their paycheck. So your payroll system, your record keeper, and your HR system all have to be on point and know what's happening and how to communicate with each other and with the new participants around what's gonna happen with their plan. A, a add-on feature to automatic enrollment is automatic escalation. So you can set an automatic enrollment rate at say 5% of compensation, and then you can add in an automatic escalation feature that just says, 
every year, unless the participant changes it themselves, we're gonna increase their deferral rate from 5% to 6%. And we're gonna add on one percentage point every year um, until we hit some arbitrary number. It could be 10%, 15, 20, could be 99% for all I care. But, um, but you, you can set it up so that you can um, automatically increase uh, participants' deferral rates. So this is, again, useful because if you're interested in your participants contributing to their own retirement and making good strides for that, increasing their, their deferral rates is going to help them. Um, also, it does continue to help with your non-discrimination testing um, for compliance persons purposes. As you might expect, keeping track of the um, automatic enrollment rate for your participants and which ones need to be increased versus not takes some ad administrative effort, right? Again, and it's communicating with your payroll service, with your record keeper, um, and your HR and the participants to make sure that everybody is in sync and making the changes as they need to. Okay. Um, Probably the most used feature in any retirement plan is loans, hardships, and termination distributions. So there are a lot of options and more coming every year um, for participants to access their funds in the retirement plan. And being able to, to talk to uh, participants about this and understanding what their options are and what options make sense for you um, and your plan are gonna be very important. So the first thing is a participant loan. Um, and it's just what it sounds like. The participant takes a loan out of the plan and the collateral for that loan is their account balance in the plan. The good thing about these loans is that they are repaid by payroll deduction. So out of their own paychecks automatically. They don't have to write a check to the plan. Um, it's just taken straight out of their paycheck. So the repayment rate is very high. Delinquency rate is very low. Um, the loan must be repaid and it, and the maximum period for a loan unless you're buying a home with it is five years um, loans have to have a reasonable interest rate usually reasonable is defined as the prime interest rate plus two percentage points because um, that is pretty close to what's commercially available if they were to go into a bank and ask for a loan um, you as the plan sponsor can restrict the money types that a participant can access for their participant loan and you can also restrict the reasons that they can take it. So you can say that they can take a participant loan for any reason that they like. You can limit it to hardship reasons, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, you know, you have a lot of control over these loans. You can control how many loans a participant can have outstanding at any given time. Um, you know, there's just a lot of options. So if a participant loan program is something that you're looking at adding or removing from your plan, make sure you're talking with your account manager and understanding all of the uh, ramifications of that decision. Okay, um, next up is a hardship distribution. And a hardship is different than a loan because this is an actual distribution that the participant does not have to pay back to their account in the plan. It is a taxable distribution, so when they do take this withdrawal, it will be included in their income for the year that they took the distribution and they will have to pay taxes on it. They also have to provide proof of the amount of their financial need, and they cannot take a distribution of more than what proof they can provide, okay? Um, the other thing about a hardship is that it can't be a reimbursement. So they can't come to you with a receipt for medical services that they have already paid. It has to be something, it has to be a bill that hasn't been paid yet that these funds are going towards. It cannot be a reimbursement. Hardship distributions are allowed for certain reasons. Um, this slide here are, lists the six reasons that are currently allowed for a participant to take a hardship withdrawal. I'm not gonna go through each of these, um, but again, if you're concerned about any of these or you have questions about them, please communicate with your account manager so that we can get through that. Okay, <clears throat> um, loans and hardships are subject to per participant fees, um, usually by the record keeper. Nova charges some fees for some of these as well. Um, so you gotta be aware of that. Usually the fee is paid by the participant, but some plan sponsors can do choose to pay those costs um, for, the, for the participants. 
it is admin additional administrative work to have these benefits available in the plan. Um, your payroll system has to be set up to, to do loan payment withholding. And if you have multiple loans to handle that, um, your, you have to have a system to collect the, um, the hardship uh, backup uh, for the, the amount that's being requested and for the approvals. Um, you have more employees that are making requests for these types of ways to access their funds, and you have to have people that are knowledgeable and willing to take those inquiries um, and get them resolved. Okay, talking briefly about employer contributions. Um, so if you make an employer contribution to the plan, like I said, what may have worked when your plan was smallish or small or younger five years ago might not be the same thing that you want now that your plan is more mature. So um, there are a lot of ways that we can edit existing match contributions in order to encourage participation, improve compliance testing results, um, you know, depending on what your what your goal is, we can help you help you reach it. If you make a our cash flow enough where you can make the occasional profit sharing or non-elective contribution to the plan, there are a ton of options that your Nova account manager can help you with that will allow you to direct more of the funds to the people that you want to benefit most out of the plan. Um, these are called new comparability allocations. And this is one of the things that Nova specializes in. So um, get in touch with your account manager if you're interested in making additional contributions to the plan, um, and we will show you ways to get the most bang for your buck. Um, if you are having a very good cash flow and expect to have it for a little while, Nova can help you with some other options as well, which includes doing things like a cash balance plan or even a 457B top hat plan um, if you really want to benefit your highest paid folks. A cash balance plan is a version of a defined benefit plan, which has very large required contribution amounts, but of those large contribution amounts, an extremely high percentage of them can go to the owners of the company and other highly paid employees. Okay, for the remainder of our presentation, we're gonna be talking about the changes that were made in the SECURE Act and then again in the SECURE Act 2.0 that was passed just last year. So, um, so a lot of these are still new, being implemented this year or in 2024, um, but it is worthwhile for you to know about them um, and talk to your account manager about the various things that you can add to your plan. So one of the first ones from the SECURE Act 1.0 is um, what's called as a, a, a qualified birth or adoption distribution. QBAD for short, or a baby distribution, depending on, on how you like to, uh, to shorten things. This one is, a, um, is an optional plan provision. So if you want to allow this, you'd have to amend your plan to do so. Um, and what it does is it allows uh, parents to take a $5,000 distribution out of the plan within one year after birth or adoption of a child. Um, and so it's a $5,000 distribution per child. Um, so if you have twins, you can get 10,000. If you have the, the, um, the mother and the father or both parents working in the same company, then each of them can take that $5,000 distribution per child. Um, in addition, this distribution is one of the first ones that the that Congress and the IRS have allowed participants to repay back into the plan um, in order to have them restore their retirement plan savings. That they the rules allow them to repay that distribution amount within three years of the distribution date. So a lot of moving parts here, a lot of things to keep track of. Um, so you would probably need a birth certificate for for the child, um, if it's a birth or if it's an adoption, then you need the formal adoption papers, for example, to prove it. Um, the, the repayment, you'd have to work extremely closely with your record keeper in order to show how that money gets put back in the plan and gets put back into the correct money types um, and all that kind of stuff. But this was, a, this was kind of a game changer because it was the first new type of distribution um, in qualified retirement plans that was allowed by law in quite a while. The other big change from SECURE Act 1.0 was around long-term part-time employees. So if you are a company who 
currently excludes part-time employees, you really need to understand this provision, okay? This provision means that if you have long-term part-time employees and they have worked more than 500 hours for you for a couple of years in a row, you have to allow them in the plan, all right? And the hours limit is very low, okay? 500 hours is essentially um, 13 weeks, so a little over three months. So if you have a part-time person who works with you for more than three months in a year, and they do so consistently, like you have summer help, um, you know, college kids coming to work for you for the summer, or um, migrant workers on a farm or something like that, you have a real chance of these people becoming eligible and being allowed to contribute to your plan in 2024. NOVA has a webinar that is dedicated to these long-term part-time employees and how it all works. Um, so if you do have this exclusion in your plan, or if you have a lot of seasonal or temporary workers, I highly encourage you to find to seek out that webinar and watch it and then get with your account manager about how you want to handle these, these participants um, in the future, because this will be a big deal for the plans that it does in fact. In brief, long-term part-time employees have to be able to contribute their own money to the plan if they have been, um, if they have worked more than 500 hours in three consecutive years. Okay, that goes back to 2021. So they would have to work 500 hours or more in 2021, 2022, and 2023 in order to join the plan on January 1st of 2024. Okay, there's a slide that we're going to get to in a minute, but the Secure Act 2.0 changed this so that beginning in 2025, participants or employees only have to work more than 500 hours for two consecutive years. So it is much easier for them to meet that eligibility requirement to join the plan. Now, when these people join the plan, they only have to be given the opportunity to contribute their own funds. They can be excluded from employer contributions, safe harbor contributions, match contributions, profit sharing contributions. Um, However, if you are a generous employer, you can allocate those funds to them. There is a lot more guidance expected from the IRS on these participants and how, these, how the mechanics of these are going to work. Um, but for now, the biggest thing is understanding when those, these folks are gonna become eligible and making sure that they are given the opportunity to contribute to the plan at the beginning of 2024. Okay, another big change in Secure Act 1.0 dealt with required minimum distributions. Um, and this one was the first time that the uh, required beginning age increased. So the, the age increased to age 72, it used to be 70 and a half. Um, and it was for people who were um, born on or after 1947, okay? Um, so, Pretty much the only rule change was the age um, and all the other rules still applied. So non-owner employees can still choose to defer um, the required minimum distributions until they have terminated employment. 5% or more owners are still required to take RMDs even if they are still employed. Okay, so that was Secure Act 1.0, the warm up for the big deal because last year, the SECURE Act 2.0, because Congress is not super creative with their laws, um, SECURE Act 2.0 came along. And this one had a whole bunch of changes, and this is how we're gonna spend our next 20 minutes talking about these. First up, Congress decided that for the SECURE Act 2.0, they really want to encourage, and in some cases mandate, more Roth contributions into retirement plans. Why do they want that? Again, Congress likes to get paid, and so this is a, a revenue raiser for them. So what this is gonna happen now is in 2024, highly compensated employees, their catch-up contributions have to be Roth. No ifs, ands, or buts about it, no splitting, it has to be all Roth. So, um, so even if you have a highly compensated employee who is deferring $22,500 in pre-tax contributions, when they kick in their first dollar of catch up, 
your payroll system has to be smart enough to allocate that money as a Roth contribution. Okay, that also means that you or your payroll system have to know which of your employees are highly compensated when the year starts. Okay, so these are some things that are going to be important for you for 2024. Non highly compensated employees that contribute catch up have to be given the option to, to make their catch up contributions in either Roth or pre tax. That is already in effect now. But the big deal is you're going to have to know who your highly compensated employees are and know that even if they are contributing their regular dollars as pre-tax, their catch-up contributions have to be contributed as Roth. So this will be one of those things that when you have your year-end um, communication with your payroll provider, you got to ask them how they're going to accommodate this. This is going to apply to every single plan that's out there. Okay. More Rothification. Congress is pushing to have employer contributions to the plan be contributed as Roth. So your safe harbor contribution, your employer match, your profit sharing, in 2024, your plan participants can choose to have some of those contributions come into the plan as Roth contributions. Currently, all employer contributions into the plan are pre-tax. So um, there's gonna be a lot more guidance coming from the IRS on this, but as early as 2024, when you make your first contribution, employer contribution for the 2024 plan year, participants have to be given the option to have some of that money be deposited as Roth, okay? The guidance from the IRS so far does not mention anything about what taxation looks like on their paychecks or how the mechanics of that are gonna work. Um, as far as I know, record keepers are working feverishly to set up um, Roth versions of their pre-tax employer money types, um, but there's, a, there's still a lot of work that's going to happen between now and January 1st. Um, another thing that was in Secure Act 2.0 uh, with not a whole lot of detail provided was a student loan match program. Maybe you heard some of this with, the, um, with Abbott Labs where they were making essentially a employer non-elective contribution when participants chose to um, pay their student loans through payroll deduction. Um, so that was kind of the impetus for this type of program to be allowed um, on a, you know, pretty much coast to coast basis. But again, there's not a lot of guidance on what the mechanics of this are going to look like. So if you have a lot of participants who have student loans, so maybe you hire a lot of recent college graduates, um, this is going to be something that you're gonna to wanna to watch closely. Um, as more guidance is provided, NOVA will provide more webinars and, and trainings and things like that on how to implement these provisions. Okay, <clears throat> another big feature of Secure Act 2.0 is Congress is adding several different ways for participants to access their retirement funds prior to termination of employment um, and putting a lot of somewhat unusual restrictions on them. Um, so you'll see by the time we get through these, there are a lot of new ways for people to access their funds and a lot of um, kind of interesting rules that are gonna be allowed next year. The first of these is what's called an emergency savings contribution. Um, this is a Roth contribution that a participant can choose to make. Um, it counts as a regular deferral for the deferral limit and for matching purposes. However, this one is has a total balance limit of $2,500. And the idea here is that the participant is allowed to put a little something away that they can access if they have a problem. Right? How many times have we read articles or stories about the average American has less than $400 in, in emergency savings, right? So this, this type of account was designed specifically to help with that particular issue. This $2,500 balance limit, um, this little segregated account, distributions are allowed from it at any time. Um, the one that's going to be interesting to implement is that no distribution fees can be charged to the participant on the first four withdrawals from this account. Um, so 
Whether the balance stays at $2,500 or goes lower, there has to be some mechanism for the record keeper or for you as the plan sponsor to know if the participant has taken more than four withdrawals from this account or not. And once they have, then they're eligible for distribution fees. Up until then, there are no distribution fees allowed to be assessed to the participant's account. So um, I, just like with all of these, we're expecting more guidance from the IRS, um, but this is gonna be a thing that is available on January 1st, 2024. Another thing that's come up is the natural disaster distribution. So this one also is effective for January 1st, 2024. Participants can take up to $22,000 out of their account per disaster. So if they are unfortunate enough to be in a federally declared disaster area twice in one year, they can take out $44,000, okay? Um, and then hopefully they move someplace that's a little less dangerous. Um, these distributions can be repaid within three years. Um, when they are repaid to the plan, they are repaid as a rollover contribution. So they are not contributed to the plan in some other way. When they get deposited back into the plan, they go in as a rollover contribution. Participants can take the income tax consequences of this distribution and spread it out over three years. For those of you who were sponsoring plans during the pandemic, this would sound familiar as one of those CARES Act distribution options where they were allowed to spread their income tax consequences of their distribution over multiple tax years. This distribution is exempt from the 10% early withdrawal penalty. So Congress has decided that if you are taking a distribution out of your retirement plan to deal with a natural disaster that has impacted you, that you should not be penalized for taking for accessing your retirement funds early. So this distribution also is going to be an optional feature. So you do not have to allow this in your plan, but if you think that this is something that would benefit your employees, then this would be something that you would want to talk to your NOVA account manager about implementing. Another new distribution type is a type that is specifically for domestic abuse. Um, this one, a participant can take a distribution within one year of a abusive act. And the rules on this are pretty vague. Um, it is a very difficult thing to put a pin on as far as what constitutes abuse um, and what doesn't. The, because of that, the plan sponsor, you as the plan sponsor, can rely on the participant's certification of a domestic abuse event. You do not need to, um, to request documentation. You don't need to get photos of bruises, for example, or recordings of harsh language. Um, you can just rely on the participant saying that this is a thing that happened. The distribution amount is a little bit smaller. It is limited to the lesser of $10,000 or 50% of the participant's account balance. Um, Essentially, this distribution is to allow a participant to get out of an abusive situation, but not enough for them to, like that's the only thing that they do. Um, the distribution can be repaid for up to three years after the withdrawal date. So we've seen that as kind of a theme on some of these Secure Act 2.0 changes. Um, and this is another, another thing like that. This distribution is also exempt from the 10% early withdrawal penalty if the participant is less than the age of 59 and a half. And then another distribution option is the emergency personal expense distribution option. This is where a participant can take one distribution per year of up to $1,000. So this, my personal opinion is that if you allow this distribution type, then there's really no reason to have the emergency savings account option that we talked about a few slides back. They are kind of uh, redundant and overlapping. Um, there's, no, there's nothing against having both, but they both kind of uh, reach for the same, for the same features here. Um, they can take up distribution one per year for up to $1,000. They must have at least $1,000 in their vested balance in their account after this distribution though. So if their vested balance is less than $2,000, they will not be able to take the full $1,000 distribution. Okay. If they take this $1,000 distribution, 
They cannot take another one of these emergency personal expense distributions for three years or until their original distribution amount is contributed back into the plan. So they don't have a special way to repay their distribution, but they can continue to make 401k deferrals or Roth deferrals that would cover the amount that they had distributed from their plan with the original distribution. Um, they can also repay the original distribution amount up to three years after withdrawal. My personal opinion is that most employees will just won't make the repayment to the plan. They will just continue to defer to the plan, and that will be how they um, how they restore their funds and, and become eligible for another distribution amount. All right, another distribution option is what's called a qualified long-term care distribution. So for this one. Um, a participant can take the lesser of $2,500 or 10% of their vested account balance. This distribution is used to pay for certified, oh, good, not good spelling there, certified long-term care insurance for the employee, for the employee's spouse, or another immediate family member. Um, so very specific for what this can be used for. Um, there's no guidance yet on whether you as the plan sponsor will have to um, collect uh, evidence that that's what this money is for. This distribution is also exempt from the 10% early withdrawal penalty if the participant is not yet age 59 and a half. So there will be a little bit more guidance coming on this one. And at this point, there is no uh, mechanism that allows repayment to the plan of this distribution amount. Okay, so that takes us out of the new distribution options, but the SECURE Act 2.0 also made some changes to required minimum distributions. So we talked about how the uh, SECURE Act 1.0 increased the required minimum uh, distribution beginning date from the age of 70 and a half to age 72. The ages are increasing again. So if you were born before 1960, now the RMD age will be 73, um, effective in 2024. If you were born after 1959, your required minimum distribution beginning age becomes 75. Um, life expectancies in the US are still rising, and so this is an attempt by Congress to kind of ratchet up the RMD requirements to kind of reflect that and be more current with the time. Um, the other big deal with the SECURE Act 2.0 is that Roth 401k contributions are now exempt from required minimum distribution requirements. So uh, if any of you have a Roth IRA, you may already know that Roth IRAs are not um, considered for required minimum distributions because they are already post-tax accounts, taking those distributions does not generate any additional income for Uncle Sam, and so there's no reason to force people to take a required minimum distribution. That has not been the case in 401k plans until now. So in 2024, if you have an entire account balance that is Roth, and you are over the age of 75, you will not have to take a required minimum distribution, okay? Um, and with more and more contribution types being offered as Roth or being forced to be Roth, um, that will be uh, a big deal for people. Um, the pre and the Roth amounts will also be removed from the calculation to determine the required minimum distribution amount from the pre-tax accounts. Um, so that will reduce the amount of, um, of required minimum distribution amounts for participants. So that is, that is kind of a sneaky provision, but it's a pretty big deal for retirement plans. Okay, um, so let's talk a little bit, since we've gone through all of these things that are available for your plan, let's talk about how we make these changes if you wanna make any changes. Like I've said a couple of times throughout this call, talk to your account manager. They can provide you very specific consulting and guidance on your particular plan, consult with you about what you're trying to accomplish with your plan and help you craft provisions that get you there. Um, the biggest thing that I wanna put in your brains about this is that amending your plan for the 2024 plan year takes some time, okay? 
So I know I, that I had mentioned earlier about safe harbor, that if you wanted to become a safe harbor plan for 2024, you wanna make that decision prior to November 1st. Our presentation here says that really October 1st is gonna be a good time to start these conversations with your account manager. Because a lot of times when you come to somebody with a change request, they're gonna to wanna to talk to you about it and make sure that it's exactly what you want and that all the downstream uh, ramifications are decided upon. Um, the other reason why we say to do these so early is because a lot of these requirement changes are going to require notification for your employees. And that notification is going to have to have is going to have to happen prior to the end of the calendar year. And so you want to set yourself up with enough time to get those notices generated and to get them sent out to your employees. All right, I mentioned earlier that we have um, additional webinars specifically about the long term part time employees but also many other webinars on many other topics. Um, and so this is the website that you wanna to go to to see our webinar selection, including our recorded webinars, um, if you missed one that has information that you will find useful for your plan. For those of you that are here for the CPA credit, um, the evaluation form is gonna be sent via email um, about an hour after this webinar, um, and you have to return the evaluation form to receive your certification. Okay, so make sure that you do that, please. Um, Yvette will probably uh, re recap that one more time when we wrap up. So um, here's my contact information in case you have questions. I'm happy to help you any way that, that I can, but I do encourage you to work directly with your account manager here at Nova if you do have questions about any of these things, um, because like I said, they know your plan already and will be in a great place to help you get the, the outcome that you're looking for. We have had a couple of questions get submitted so far today, and we've got a few minutes left. So I am going to, um, to go through those. So bear with me just a second here as I get to them. Okay, first question. All right, Yvette already answered it, but the question was, will I be able to get CE credit for ASPA with this webinar? And uh, the answer to that is yes, this webinar is eligible for ERPA, ASPA, and Texas CPA. Um, and then we had another question, as far as the Roth in-plan conversions go, what are the tax implications for that for any given year overall? And are there any more favorable years to do that than other years? Or is it same across the board timeframe wise? Um, so this is a good question, and this is not a question that you're gonna be able to answer um, proactively in advance. Um, so the participant chooses the Roth conversion, and when the Roth conversion happens, that is going to be the year that the income tax hit happens to the participant. So generally speaking, a participant's gonna to wanna to do that in a year where they're income is either already high and they're already paying a boatload of taxes anyway, so they don't feel like it's gonna move the needle that much, or they may wanna do it in a year where their tax rate is really low, and so this additional income um, will not necessarily crush their marginal tax rate, but it will bump them into a, you know, a tax rate that they're still reasonable with. Um, but the tax hit is going to be a very big consideration for Roth conversions. Um, participants can choose to have tax withholding done at the time of a Roth conversion to kind of take some of the bite out of that tax liability, but it is not required. Um, and if, it, if they choose to not withhold anything, then they gotta be ready for that, that big income tax hit when they file their taxes at the end of the year. So I hope that answered the question. Um, if it didn't, please uh, post again and, uh, and we'll keep talking about it. Okay, next question um, is, how does the domestic abuse distribution work in conjunction with a quadro? Would a domestic abuse distribution be available to be taken by the abused from a spouse's retirement plan prior or even concurrent with a quadro? Um, that's a good question. Generally speaking, um, maybe not generally. I guess when I have thought about these domestic abuse distributions is would be prior to a separation or a divorce, but I guess that's not a requirement. Um, so, uh, so generally speaking, a quadro in a divorce process takes a very long time, right? Um, so if a 
uh, and generally speaking, during a, a, a quadro process, distributions are put on hold for either participant's account that's um, separating from, from their marriage. Um, and I would imagine that in a domestic abuse distribution situation, a record keeper would be willing to waive the distribution hold to allow the distribution of that domestic abuse thing. Now, all of that is speculation. The IRS has not provided any guidance on that particular fact pattern. Um, but uh, again, assuming that they're reasonable people, um, that is the way that I would read that as, as going. So that's it for me. Um, thank you very much for your questions and your time today. We are right at two o'clock. So um, have a great rest of your Thursday and thank you for spending time with me this afternoon. Awesome, thank you, Jason. Uh, again, just a reminder for everybody to fill out the pop-up survey at the end of this webinar um, so we can track your time and participation uh, if you are needing a certificate. Um, if you do have any questions, you can go ahead and reach out to Jason um, or you can email us at webinars at noah401k.com. Uh, to view this webinar or any of the recordings that you may have missed, you can follow us on our YouTube channel which is Nova401k Associates, or you could visit our website, which is www.nova401k.com backslash webinars. Thank you again, Jason, for your time today. And thanks to everybody for joining. And we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.